I've been given 10 minutes. So this is a cup of soup paper. I shall deliver desiccated thought flakes. You will <laughs> add boiling water and they may become flavorsome. So <clears throat> as you all know, in September of this year, the temple of Baal in Palmyra was destroyed by ISIS and we have the before and after images of it here. When I see an image of this kind, I do not uh, myself immediately think this is other, this is someone else, this is barbaric. I do not think uh, what all the newspapers said when the Taliban blew up the statues uh, the, of Buddha in um, Bamiyan in Afghanistan in 2001, all the newspapers said this was medieval, medieval iconoclasts. No, I think uh, this, what we see here, was early modern uh, iconoclast. I think this is us. We've been here. And so I immediately go back to uh, a kind of notion or appeal to a historiographical practice of what I call cultural etymology. We've been here before. Cultural etymology, whereby I see an event in the present and I think the truth of this event is recoverable in our own history. It is imminent in our own history and that we illuminate the current event not by looking elsewhere, not by othering it, but rather by seeing it as part of our own history. When one does that, one looks to the destruction of the Temple of Baal as uh, related uh, in the, the Book of Kings uh, in 687 BC. I won't read the whole passage uh, now, but bought the statue out of Baal's temple, burnt it and broke it in pieces. They also destroyed the temple of Baal and made a jakes, a, a toilet in its place unto this day. We've been here before, uh, but that was the 7th century BC. But in the 17th century uh, AD, we're still talking about the temple of Baal, still referring to the same passage. Here is Henry, Henry Ainsworth, a leader of a Puritan sect in, uh, in, in exile in Amsterdam in 1611, uh, referring to Manasses, the son of Hezekiah, who in 16, uh, 687 BC uh, was destroying uh, the, 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 what was building up uh, altars for Balaam and made groves and worshipped all the host of, of heaven. So the temple of Baal is still at issue as an example of idolatrous behavior in 1611. So um, when faced with this effort of trying to see how iconoclasm is built imminently into our own history, I, as a, a cultural historian of late medieval, early modern Europe, but particularly England, uh, go back to the period of iconoclasm legislated in England uh, between, between 1538 and 1642, 100 years of legislated iconoclasm in Britain, uh, more centralized uh, by statute, uh, more widespread than anywhere else in Europe. And what I do when faced with that period of iconoclasm is isolate six classic phases of iconoclastic practice. And here I'm summarizing my book called Under the Hammer, uh, Iconoclasm in the Anglo-American Tradition, which was published in 2000. And 10, we have these six classic phases. At the end of my account of these classic phases, I'll talk about how there is good news uh, when we reflect on those six classic phases, but also there's very bad news. The first one is unlicensed iconoclasm. Outbreaks of iconoclastic riots, as we see here in Zurich in 1524, but not 
legislated. This is always followed stage one by stage two, which is licensed iconoclasm. Uh, we had this in 1547 in England, Archbishop Cramner, after having said that in 1538, all those images to which idolatrous worship be paid shall be destroyed. But by 1547, he'd come up with the obvious problem that it was difficult to work out which, to which idols idolatrous worship was being paid and which ones weren't. So there was only one way out of that, which was to destroy every religious image, which is what we've got here in the uh, example of um, the beginning of the reign of uh, Edward VI in England in 1547. So you can see the papists packing away their poultry. Uh, a statue is being pulled down here, uh, a fire with lots of crucifixes here, uh, and all the material uh, from inside the church is being taken back to Rome here. And here we have the stripped uh, church uh, after the iconoclastic practice has been made. I just add in a little example, slightly more uh, contemporary of licensed uh, iconoclasm, again from Bamiyan 2001. Um, but stage three is uh, after the licensed iconoclasm, we have inevitably always the resurgence of images. Those who love the images put them back. But also there's a problem which is that the uh, space left by the image actually leaves a hole. Uh, think in your own mind's eye to the gap left by the statues of Buddha in Bamiyan. If the Taliban had wished to do a really decent job on the Bamiyan statues, they wouldn't have left the hole where the statue was because the hole evokes spectrally the image of the statue itself. In fact, they should have blown up the whole mountain uh, in which those statues were embedded. But then, of course, there's the problem that you've got the hole where the mountain was. So uh, iconoclasm is an ever-expanding process requiring ever more destruction if the statues uh, and their spectral images don't take up habitation in the mind. So um, the third stage is when the statues are either physically reinstated or if they enter more problematically still into the mind itself. If the idols are removed from the churches but steal into the mind and statues are erected in the heart, that is deformation, not reformation, a change of place, not a driving away of the thing. And so much the more dangerous because it is, because it is interior and personal. Already in 1559, we have that stealing of the image in its spectral form into the recesses of the psyche, a very dangerous place for the iconoclast. Um, I, I just uh, add this little uh, example, again from Bamiyan, of uh, the resurgence of images, this beautiful uh, light display of the, the, the destroyed Buddha. Stage four is resurgence of licensed iconoclasm. In England, after Archbishop Lord under Charles I had tried to reinstate the beauty of uh, English churches, in his phrase, um, in the English Civil War, as in all revolutionary periods, we have uh, licensed uh, <coughs> resurgence, reappearance of licensed iconoclasm. So in 1643, under a revolutionary government, we have a, uh, a statue um, issuing uh, permission, demanding uh, the destruction of all those resurgent images. This is an image from the Lady Chapel in Ely, just north of Cambridge. But recent scholarship has shown that upwards of 90% of all the religious images in East Anglia uh, were destroyed in the early 1640s. So uh, resurgence of licensed iconoclasm. The problem is that uh, once you destroy the resurgent images, the damn thing is 
that there are always yet more images. It's impossible to do the work completely. The, the main psychic characteristic of the iconoclast is exhaustion. The iconoclast is always saying, we're working so hard, and yet these images are still there. In the, uh, the, 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 the early 17th century, English iconoclasts and the Protestant uh, public more generally are uh, faced with all this exhaustion uh, and faced with the fact that they could now travel to a declining Italy and discover that these Catholic images were in fact really beautiful and simultaneously getting much cheaper. That they discovered that they could bring them back to England and they had to work out an alternative to the exhausting practice of iconoclasm. And that alternative was called the museum. We're going to bring this material back out of the churches. We're going to put it in the museum. The public's going to be different. It will no longer be the credulous and idolatrous peasant. It will now be the cultivated aristocrat. And we're going to call it something different. We're going to call it art. Uh, so here we have a Catholic image of such museum from the early 17th century. But you'll notice uh, in the very middle of it, just here, we have an evocation of what has produced the museum in the first place, which is the act of, of iconoclasm. So the memory, the, the, the memory of iconoclasm is always embedded in the place of asylum, uh, the museum. Um, by the 18th century, of course, we have uh, the museum culture in full flight. Here we have uh, the place of idolatry Rome, which is now broken up into neatly purchasable segments, wholly manageable segments. We have the uh, iconoclast um, Moses here, um, but Moses is no longer the iconoclast. He's a statue by Bernini and uh, by Michelangelo, and he's really, really purchasable. So uh, iconoclast, iconoclasm has it's been defanged in this space for the cultivated aristocrat. Sorry, Ray, i got to give you a 30-second warning. So got it. On. Stage, stage uh, six is safe iconoclasm in the sacred temple of the museum. This is MoMA, uh, nothing if not a Puritan temple, all white, uh, hardly any images, and the image of the uh, broken image, which is kind of a safe replaying of iconoclasm in the contemporarily sacred space of the museum. So where's the, where's the good news, where's the, bad, where's the bad news? The good news is that iconoclasm moving through these, uh, does inevitably move through these six stages. Uh, iconoclasm becomes managed and manageable. The bad news is that it takes 150 years. Thank you very much. <laughs>